thank you. Let me introduce uh, Larry Kiliszewski. Um, Larry uh, is an American businessman. He's in Houston, Texas, where Rice University is one of our uh, co-sponsors. And he, he runs Zewski Corporation, which takes um, medical devices into market. That is, he designs them for manufacture and gets them ready to be built. And that includes um, obtaining, doing the things necessary to obtain US FDA regulation. As, as you may know, other nations don't have to respect the US FDA. They have their own regulatory regimes, but they often follow the, the major uh, large company countries in terms of doing this. Um, so let me just make sure I believe I had forgotten to make him a co-host. So Larry can now share his screen. I probably am not doing a great job introducing him. There are probably other things he needs to say, but let's get started with Larry's talk. And thank you everybody for being here. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks Rob. I appreciate the introduction. I'm trying to share a screen. Can you guys see? It's black right now. Okay. Sometimes it, it, it takes a few seconds for something to come up, but it, it could be a no, different problem. There we go. Well, it's saying, okay. I might have to, to uh, share from my main screen. So you'll just see my slides. You can see that can now, see right? It now. We can see okay. it now. So, um, so the primary point of my, my talk is, is about uh, the design for manufacturer process. I, I um, kind of came up with this tag phrase for the talk, like great designs start with great ideas, but great devices or great device success starts with a great process. And I say that because um, we've been developing products for a long time. We have lots of great ideas come in Many times we design products that work exactly as they're supposed to, the way the inventor or the clinician wants, but they don't go to market or they don't make it very far because there's not a process built around the way, uh, the, a program built around getting them to market. You know, the, early on in my career, people would just bring me ideas. I would do the designs and then give them back to them, but they didn't understand the process and I didn't either earlier in my career. So um, that's kind of the point of the talk. Uh, you guys saw that slide switch? Okay, so just real quick on how I got here. Um, so I worked in, in device design for seven years before I started my own business in uh, 2004 and became self-employed. And I've ran my own design firm for 18 years. And currently we do about 850 hours a month in, in medical industry consulting. Um, but a few years ago, I kind of uh, took an unconventional path. I'm, I went to a research hospital um, in the Northeast and I started discovering all these ideas that the hospitals were developing that weren't going anywhere. Um, and I found out that there was funding available for some of the ideas, but there was just no way, they didn't know how to get these ideas out of the hospitals. And most of them just died, like one in a thousand maybe would make it. So I wrote this blog, Incubators, Hospitals, Universities, and Grant, uh, uh, Grants, and today Zuski Corp to talk about my personal journey and wanting to kind of explore that space. We still run our business just as normal with companies, um, but I personally have become more involved in this space. And that's, that's how I uh, met Rob through uh, Dr. Abidi. So the goals of my talk are to examine the idea of a proof of concept and its value in the medical device space, explain the method of translation of a proof of, con a proof of concept to a safe approved device ready for the market using a design for manufacture process present why conventional institutional methods of idea translation reduce potential for real world innovation and to propose how a shift in the process can open up innovation to more companies and markets without compromising free trade in the current space. So the first goal examining the idea of a proof of concept and its value. Um, so a proof of concept usually is the result of a bunch of innovative minds working together with limited resources to solve a problem. So these pictures are actually have a team we worked with at Rice to come up with a, a device during one of their scap, capstone projects. We sponsored it. So at the end of the project, they gave us all the stuff they used to develop it. And you can see in the picture on the left, like these are all the things they, 
they had to pile through to come up with the concept that they developed. And that concept is this little blue box in the, in the bottom picture. So uh, many people in this seminar are, are, are well aware of the amount of uh, resources it goes into just come up with something very little and, and uh, significant. But I, I think that this picture really exemplifies that. So the blue box is an aerosolized drug delivery system which synchronizes breathing with uh, delivery dosage and frequency. So a proof of concept is not a commercial ready design. I think we kind of all agree with that. It has to go through a rigorous development process, but if well executed, it can greatly reduce the effort for research and ideation. And that's important because a lot of people are, they, they say to me, well, why even do a proof of concept? Um, a proof of concept saves thousands of hours of design work uh, in the professional space. So lots of money too. Um, they primarily address communicating potential solutions quickly, narrowing options for the design direction and acquiring funding and intellectual property. But they don't often address designs easily translatable to volume manufacturing. Um, they don't often address an an analyzing the costs associated with uh, sales and sustainability or sufficient testing and design controls to meet regulatory requirements, which is a unique challenge in the medical community. So because a proof of concept may contain very little of the final software materials and processes to build a production device, many times the exposure of regulations to a proof of concept are small or none. The second objective of the, the talk is really to explain the method of translation from a proof of concept to a safe approved device ready for use using the design manufacturing process. So when we bring in a proof of concept to our office, uh, one of the first things we do is we assess, we assess the cost of the device. We identify high cost components, many times which are um, a small percentage of the components, but a large percentage of the cost. We conduct a labor cost evaluation based on geographical location of where we believe it'll be manufactured. And, um, we try to get a better understanding of the, the best manufacturing methods to create volume cost analysis. So, you know, it might come in as a, a metal or a wood box, but they want to make 50,000 a year. We're probably not going to go into production in metal or wood. The second thing we assess is the design. We'll review other industry solutions um, for, for offering options for cost and lead time reduction. So sometimes people get stuck in, I'm in the aerospace industry, I'm working on an aerospace project, I'm going to look at aerospace components, but sometimes there's a medical component that could be used that may cost less and is used in higher volume medicine. So it allows you to transition that part over to years, provided, of course, it uh, passes testing. Um, in some cases, multiple, multiple components can be combined into less parts, adding benefits. So maybe you have three components that have their own electronics, and you can buy those three components for less if they're not electrically controlled components like a solenoid, and then put those electronics on your PC board. So you could cut your cost in half by replacing those with simpler components and then controlling them with your own board. And redesign can reduce production process for difficult to integrate available solutions. So this means that sometimes off the shelf parts um, are more expensive than you just redesigning yourself, something yourself, depending on your application. And then last, we assess safety and compliance. So we research existing improved technologies for testing and safety compliance records. We can go to the FDA website, and look at a similar device that had an F510K file, and we can find out what tests that device was required to go through. Um, we study ISO standards, and we develop SOPs and test plans uh, for the best manufacturing processes for the device. And we implement design control procedures for labeling, traceability, and oversight. So the process basically that we're talking about is gonna pop up here in the middle, right? There's pre-development research, ideation and proof of concept. Then we do our process, controlled development process. And then the last process is manufacturing post-market market surveillance. So the high risk process for small manufacturers is this green process here. And it's why small manufacturers don't want to get involved in taking on the design of a a proof of concept device or even an open like shared device where you say, hey, you manufacture it, you can make the money, but you know, somebody's got to do the testing and everything. That's a very expensive process. Um, it's high re highly regulated from, from this point on for class two and three devices. 
So this leads down to the next slide. This is our controlled design process. When, when a product gets out of proof of concept and we're gonna design for manufacture, we follow this four phase process. So we wanna know what is being made? What are the features and benefits? What is the technical solution of the features and benefits? Do the features and benefits work as expected? And do the features and benefits work for the user? So these processes, we have a, a, a common uh, name for them. They're called inputs, outputs, verification, and validation. And from those, we produce alpha and beta prototypes, production prototypes, and production product. So its main objective is narrowing the idea from what could be the idea to what is likely to be the proof of concept in preparation for defining the intended use statement and device inputs. And then from that, the, you build the product uh, you plan to do a, a design for manufacture build. So now if you simply follow a two to four year control process, the rest of the way is fairly easy. Not free. <laughs> so three, present why conventional institutional methods of ideas reduce potential for real world innovation. So proof of concept problem solving is found in institutions because they have open-minded thinking. They have the ability to solve complex problems. They're trained in the sciences. They have freedom to explore, and they have creativity-driven goals. But design for manufacturer problem solving is found in industry because it requires knowledge of common practices, application awareness, people trained in the skills trade, um, a structured environment, and production-driven goals. So when we look at large medtech manufacturers, um, they have the fortune of having access to all of these expertise in-house. They have advanced R&D departments where PhDs create the tomorrow applications from proof of concepts, much like the makers and the developers and the think tanks. They have conventional R&D departments that translate those designs to a manufacturable device and manage design controls, similar to the way we do here at our office. And they have manufacturing departments which work with those R&D teams to pr prepare for production runs. This makes large med tech companies ideal for partnerships with institutions. The problem is large companies are very selective about what they will work on and they leave thousands of designs untouched that have the potential to impact global health issues. So my key point is institutions typically lean towards large companies that have internal resources for both the artist and the technician, but they also have large bureaucracies boards they report to, conflicts of interest, and sometimes just buy out technology in order to prevent market penetration from other companies. So our fourth goal is to propose how to shift, uh, how, to propose how a shift in the process can help open up innovation to more companies and markets without compromising free trade in the current space. So I wanna talk about Wichita State University. I, I was introduced to this university a couple years ago and um, I discovered that they are doing what I'm talking about. In, in 1985, they launched a program called NIAR, National Institute for Aerospace Research. And um, the point was to try to combine private industry with inst institutional resources and government funding and, and basically move along the aerospace industry. Wichita is the aerospace capital of America, even though probably nobody knows that. Almost aer every aerospace company has a manufacturing facility there and a lot of development and research is done there. Um, they uh, were able to increase research and development focus on the needs of aerospace. Today, they do $190 million. They have a $190 million budget and they staff 975 people uh, in a 1.6 million square foot facility in, in uh, Wichita. Uh, it's spread out over the city, of course. Um, so they successfully paired nonprofit institutional resources with professional industry to generate one of the largest aeronautical production research test facilities in the country. Then more recently, what they did is when COVID hit, they decided, even though they were specializing in aerospace, that they thought they could take their institutional resources and combine them with local resources, professional uh, support, and help solve their COVID issue. Their particular COVID issue was because they have a lot of manufacturing facilities in aerospace, people had to go to work in order for the economy of Wichita to stay intact. So they launched the Molecular Diagnostic Laboratory. They spent four months putting it together, opened the doors, 
and they're able to analyze 4,500 COVID tests per day. So basically what they did is they set up a facility where they can train companies to test their employees every single day. And then in the morning, those tests are sent to the lab. They run the test to the lab. If anybody's sick, they're sent home. And this allowed them to keep their community functioning during 2020 and 2021. So my proposed institutional development model looks like this. You have an initial institution effort and institution funding. Uh, in our case, we had a, uh, a, a capstone project we did. There's other resources, things come from institutions, hospitals, and universities. And they develop some kind of a proof, proof of concept. Um, and the institution then would create an assessment team to look at that proof of concept and decide whether it's something that has potential for the market. Second, they would add a design for manufacturer team. The institution would join with private sector effort through grant funding and private funding, and they would create a controlled design for manufacturer process for that device. They would assign a clinical champion and a project manager to build a DFM team to develop, a quali uh, and, to develop and qualify the product for production. Sorry, I thought it would be easier if I just read through my slides. <laughs> so. Um, then they would add a translation team, and through the connections uh, made during development, they would determine the most likely impactful candidates for manufacturing limited production volumes. And then finally, they would partner with that team. The manufacturer would take over production and design largely qualified for regulatory submission products. So at this point, the device is already designed and tested for production. The only thing that hasn't been done is the submission to the, the regulatory body for approval. So the private industry effort would take that over because the product has already been de-risked. The Wichita State model proves smaller co-op partnerships can be successful as large, uh, as successful as large companies. They can function together in a regulated space. They can combine creativity and production-driven teams. It benefits all parties involved and they can generate income that can be used to advance other efforts and in institutions. So that was my talk and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much for uh, sticking on time. And I'd like to say this is one of the most important talks of the entire conference because it's, it's one of the, the things that we haven't focused on yet. How do you really get to market? You know, basically every medical device is gonna be delivered by a company and it's going to be a company that makes money. And we can't save lives if we can't get innovations into companies that eventually get into someone's lungs in terms of respiration technology. And what Larry is, is proposing is a fix to something that the people that I mostly have worked with, Helpful Engineering and Public Invention, have not done well. In, on Saturday, we heard from Rice University and Cambridge, Jenny Malloy of Cambridge. Those people are creating device designs at the proof of concept level very effectively. I think they're doing a good job. The whole global humanitarian community has not done design for manufacture well. And I think what Larry is saying here is we can step up our design for manufacture um, game by combining it with profit-making opportunities, as long as we understand all of the issues which are involved, in, including the, the regulatory issues. Um, so let me just uh, mention, um, Larry works for Zuski Corp, and this is exposure for him. Reggie Nakin asks, hi, Larry, valuable info, thanks. Will you be willing to look at working for a prototype with a patent? Yeah, actually, so just, Anybody that has any ideas or anything they want to talk about or share or call us, like uh, me personally, I'm happy to spend you know half hour hour on the phone talk about your product, the potential for the market, like how easy it would be to manufacture, any questions you have. And you will be doing that in Rehive, I hope. Even though I don't want people to miss Debbie Aloyo's talk, which is coming up in just one minute. Um, uh, uh, Megan or Sabia, can you please repost the Rehive link here? I saw that quite a few people were talking to Pierre. I hope people will talk to Larry. I would like to use this as an opportunity to say, even, even Larry and Pierre, who know what they're talking about, 
there's no way they can answer all the questions during this conference. What we as a group in this conference need to do is to think about what we're going to take out of the conference. Are we going to write white papers? Are we going to try to change policy? Are we, you know, how are we going to take what we're learning and turning it into action, which eventually saves lives? Now, personally, I'm playing the long game. There, there are a lot of people on Leith Greenslade's call every Monday who are trying to save lives this month, and God bless them for doing so. But this conference is about how are we going to save lives more effectively in the coming decade? And that's a long conversation, but Larry has, has given us a really critical um, piece of it. So those of you who want to talk to him right now, please go to um, the Rehive link, and I'll ask Larry to go there and go to the meet with the speakers table. Um, uh, there's a question from Azad Mashari, but I'll ask um, Larry to read that in the Q&A thing and answer it in Rehive. 